Good to be here tonight. Uh, good to be back over in East Tennessee where everybody talks like I do over here. <laughs> we've been, since Dad passed away in December, we've uh, been traveling every weekend somewhere. It's called us, wanting to meet us. Uh, some of the churches that support us said, no, Dad, but didn't had never met me and my family. Uh, so we've been traveling. We've been to Connecticut, and uh, we've been to Rhode Island, and uh, Texas and Oklahoma and all uh, Illinois, Ohio. We've been all over the place since December, and I always have to explain uh, where I'm from and what I'm doing, why I talk like this. So the th one thing I can tell anybody in this room, if you have a bad accent, you can't talk right, you didn't go to college, uh, you're not really much of nothing, God can use you. You're a candidate to do his work because he chooses the lowly things of the world, the despised things of the world to bring glory to him. So if you're in here today and you don't think you're much of nothing and you had not been to Bible school and you're ignorant and talk funny like I do, God can use you in a mighty way. You just have to let him do it. And uh, so I'm living proof of that, that he'll use you if you just allow him to do it. You have to give yourself to him and he'll do that with you. Uh, my lovely wife is not with me today. Uh, Thursday, she had appendicitis. Uh, she was up all night sick, and uh, we had eaten at a, China, a Japanese uh, steakhouse for my other son's birthday, and uh, I, I felt bad, too. I thought we got some bad food, and I kept going, oh, you'll be all right. This, it's just a little, some kind of food poison. We get it in Mongolia all the time when we're over there eating. We get a good case of food poison about once a week over there, so we're kind of used to getting uh, eating and getting sick. Uh, but she just got worse and worse, and that morning she said, I have to go to the hospital. So uh, we took her to a little local country hospital in Corinth, Mississippi, and uh, they, they diagnosed her with her appendicitis, and they took it out, and she was back in an hour. Uh, it's amazing what they can do now in surgery. They took her appendix out and sent her home in about an hour. And uh, we have Christian health care ministries, if y'all know what that is. It's a, a shared policy. And, and they asked me if I had insurance, and I told them what I had. And they said, oh, we'll just send you a bill, and we'll worry about that later. Pretty nice hospital over there, isn't it? So I'm sure we'll get a bill pretty soon. So I know God will take care of it through that ministry we work in. Uh, I'm going to update you on the ministry. First, I want to thank you for uh, your partnership. And I call it a partnership. Uh, I don't call it just support, but we get your support and prayer. Uh, can't do it without you, and you're actually the biggest church that supports us. Uh, you're our biggest supporter and our uh, financially and hopefully prayerfully. The uh, Bible says in Philippians that when you give to missions and missionaries and people that are saved, that goes to your account in heaven. Uh, and so this is your ministry. It's not just my ministry, God's ministry. You share in this ministry with us. And uh, when people in Mongolia and Thailand are saved, uh, then you can put that to your account in heaven. When you get to heaven, you meet some, some old Chinggis Hans offsprings. Uh, you can be part, uh, take uh, stock in the fact you have something to do with that over your prayer and your support that you give us. So I thank you for that. I thank you for the hotel room that you're going to give us tonight where we can rest uh, when we leave. The only downside of that, and I see Brother Mike back there, that a friend of mine I've made friends with uh, that attends your church. I think you're new here, right, Brother Mike? Good to see you, brother. Uh, the only downside to me and my son, this is Johnny, my son, he's 14 years old. Uh, when I, me and him check in a hotel together, we get funny looks. When they see an old man with an Asian kid going in the hotel, I always have to say, this is my son. I'm not in child trafficking. And uh, when, I wear my, when I have my suit and tie on, we go in the hotel room, they think I'm the boss of the child traffickers when we go in there. So uh, it's always a weird experience when I go in there with my Asian family. And uh, I told my wife the other day, you know, my son, y'all never met my son Clint, Tommy's grandson. Clint Tillman, he's 35. He went to Mongolia and served with us as missionaries uh, uh, for three years and met his Mongolian wife there. And uh, they have two children, uh, Tail Moon and Alina, my grandchildren. They live over in Birmingham, Alabama. <clears throat> Good Christian young man. And uh, his children are Asian. I have three Asian sons. 
Uh, one of them name is Goncoleg. He's back in Mongolia. He was living here in America. He is a, a Bible school graduate from Florida down at Pensacola Christian College. And uh, he went back to Mongolia and praise God, he's serving with us in Mongolia. He's about 28 years old. He is a Bible school graduate. I'm not, but he is. Uh, and he knows more about the Bible than I do. But we know the same author of the Bible. That's all that's important. We're, we're related to him together. And uh, he's working over in Mongolia. And I told my wife, I said, you know, if the Lord don't come back, and a hundred years from now there's a bunch of Mongolians sitting around, they'll say, you know, about a hundred years ago we used to be white people. Because the Tillman family name is taking a turn. And it's going into Asia now. So there'll be a bunch of Asians with the last name of Tillman. All of my children are named Tillman, and my, my uh, Ghana's a Tillman. My son has Mongolian children named Tillman. So the Tillman bloodline is taking a turn to, to the Asian culture and Asian side. Uh, so hopefully the Lord will come back. I believe he is soon. The Bible says we don't know what day he's coming back, but they, we know the season. And uh, we do know that season. Uh, you know, there's people since the Lord ascended to heaven uh, thought that the second coming was imminent. Uh, but, you know, it's all really about Israel, and there's nothing left to happen there. We, I went on a missions trip to uh, uh, Israel several years ago, and, you know, they have everything to build the temple sitting right there waiting. And they pray every day that a, a rocket will hit that uh, mosque on temp, the temple mount where they can run up there and build that temple. And that's really all that, uh, that, that we're waiting on is for, for the temple. That can be built during the tribulation period. And all of this is ready right now for the Lord to come back. There's nothing left to happen. Uh, so we're just waiting any day for him to come back uh, and prayerfully to be during our lifetime. Uh, I'd love to go up in the rapture, not because I'm scared to die. Nobody wants to die, but I'm not scared to. Uh, but I'd like to know what that felt like to go up in the rapture, wouldn't you? I'd rather feel that than to die, so we pray to the Lord to come back or call us home and we can go up in the rapture. Uh, I do want to update you on the ministry, even though we've been back since December uh, when Dad passed away. Who knows my dad in here, Tommy Tillman? Raise your hand. Pretty much everybody, everybody has met him. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that I was born into that family. I was really blessed by being... Tommy Tillman and Joanne Tillman's son. I appreciate you still ha helping us taking care of my mother. Uh, we, we still take care of her through the ministry. And because of your gifts and your prayer, my mother has not had to move. She, her bills are being paid. And, uh, and her God loves her. And thank you for helping because her life without dad is, is continuing like it was. Uh, only thing missing is dad is missing out of her life. And my mother, if you think my dad was a good Christian man, you ought to meet my mother. If you've never met her, she's a very strong Christian lady. And uh, she just had a granddaughter die here about a month or two months ago. So she's had lost her husband, two daughters, two grandchildren. And that's all happened to her here in the last five or six years. So y'all remember her in prayer and thank you for taking care of her. Uh, the ministry in uh, Thailand, I want to kind of update you on that a little bit. Uh, I want to bring a short message to you. I don't really call it a message. Uh, if you know my dad, I'm not a whole lot like him. I kind of resemble him a little bit. I don't know what, how my dad was so appealing. He was very appealing to people. He had that about him where everybody loved my dad. And... Uh, I, and I don't know if it's the way he acted or the way he looked. I never thought he was a handsome guy. Did y'all think he was a handsome guy? We had a young lady visit us in Mongolia and stayed with us for two months. And I asked her, Dad knew her. I didn't even know her. He'd met her, in a, her and her family in a church over in North Carolina. And I didn't really know her. But when I asked her, I said, what is it that everybody likes about my dad so much? She was a young girl, about 18 or 19. And uh, he wasn't there. He was back in the States. And I said, why, do, why does everybody like my dad? She goes, well, he's cute. And I said, my dad's cute? And she, I said, I don't think. She said, yeah, he looks like a leprechaun. <laughs> so if y'all knew my dad, <laughs> she, 
She said he wears suspenders, he's got a big stomach, he's real short, and he reminds me of a leprechaun. So uh, that's why I think that was one of the appeals of Daddy. He had a great personality, and I'm going to bring out a couple of things on him tonight after I update the ministry and uh, biblical stuff about my dad and what made him, in my opinion, a very good missionary. Uh, I think he was, and I've met a lot of missionaries. We work with a lot of them. And I'm not saying it because I'm, I'm dad's son. Uh, to be honest with you, I didn't really have a good relation, not a bad relation. I didn't have any relationship with my dad after I was saved. Uh, before I was saved, he always worked all the time, and I worked all the time, especially after I grew up. Uh, so we didn't have that big of a relationship. After we were saved, we got close. I did get close to him in the last 20 years of his life. And when I was first saved, I, I, this is one of the first churches I came to. Uh, he, who was going here 20 years ago? Raise your hand. If you were here 20 years ago. That's when I, I met Pastor Lawson, and I was a new Christian. I came here with Dad, and I'm going to always butter him up when I come here, not because I have to, because he deserves it. I think Brother Lawson deserves it. One of the best teachers I ever heard when I walked in here on Sunday morning. My dad preached that Sunday. And I got to hear Brother Lawson teach Sunday school. Are you still teaching Sunday school Sunday morning, Brother? On and off. Okay, he was, that was one of the best lessons I'd ever heard taught. And I was really impressed with the way he teaches and how he uh, can convey thoughts in the Bible. And, uh, and his preaching the same way. We, as we're being recorded, he gets recorded. And somebody puts it out on YouTube. I, I heard y'all didn't do that, but somebody does. So I get it every, every sermon he preaches pops up on my phone and says there's a new message out by Brother Lawson. So I don't know who that comes from, but I appreciate it. I listen to him and enjoy his preaching, and I say it every time I come here that I steal some of his sermons and preach them in Mongolia. So uh, that's the best form of flattery. Is, uh, imitating somebody is a good form of flattery. So uh, He is a good preacher, and I enjoy preaching, uh, hearing him preach. So if you came today wanting to hear a good sermon or a good message, if you, if you hurry, you can get down to church down the road because he's not a, I'm nowhere near the preacher that he is. But I do want to update you on your ministry that we do together with the Lord, and we do it for him in the country of Thailand and Mongolia. Uh, we're continuing the work that Dad started many years ago in Thailand. We went back there, me and my wife and family, and spent some time and Dad, due to his, to his uh, advancing age, had kind of neglected Thailand just a little bit. And uh, the leper colony that's left, we have one leper colony left, and that's in the town of Ching, uh, Ching Rai up in North Mongolia, uh, Thailand, not Mongolia. And uh, when we went over there, it got kind of run down uh, from neglect. Uh, we had six lepers that were in the leper colony. And uh, we've since built that up to 13 lepers. We're taking care of 13 lepers now. And every one of the lepers are, are say that they're saved. They pray the sinner's prayer and been baptized. And uh, we're taking care of them. There's a cure for leprosy. Uh, I don't know if y'all know that, but there's a cure for it. Uh, and the government gives lepers money. Uh, there was 13 leper or 12 leper colonies in the country of Thailand at one time. Now there's one. And that's our leper colony in Ching Mai, or Ching Rai, and the name of it's Home of Grace. Uh, we changed the name on it, got the paperwork straightened out where we won't lose it. Uh, all of that stuff had kind of fallen apart over the years. Dad really devoted his life to Mongolia uh, there in his final years and kind of neglected it. God called us to keep that work going in Thailand. We have a Thai pastor there, and his name is Pastor Tan, T-A-N. He's been with us for many years. He was with Dad even before I was saved. He's a good pastor, but he's a pastor of a leper church. Not a lot of people want to go to church with lepers. Uh, we want to build a church there separate from the leper colony. Uh, if anybody in this room today, if God's calling you to be a missionary to Thailand, uh, we'd be glad to really help you and do what we can if you're called there to build a church. We don't need any help. In the leper colony, we have a guy there named A that does that with us, a Thai man, and he's a really good Christian man, and he oversees the leper colony. Uh, but we can get you over there and stay, but need full-time missionary if you want to be one to Thailand. 
I see Brother Lawson looking at me like, huh, oh, sounds pretty good. <laughs> but if God's calling you there, just see us, and we'll be glad to work with you. We'll give you a place to stay. Uh, you can live there on the premises if you want to live with a bunch of lepers. Uh, that would be a good place to go and be a, a, a missionary. So we're going to continue that work, and we pray that y'all continue to pray for that and help us with that. Uh, as we do reach the lepers that are falling through the cracks, that don't that are, don't have the cure, or they wait too long, and uh, they don't get the, the medicine that it takes, and they do develop leprosy. Uh, while we've been gone from Mongolia, we've been gone for one year in December. December the 10th will be a year that Dad passed away. Uh, been fast. It just seems like yesterday Dad passed. Time goes fast, don't it? And uh, we'll all be there too one day, and it won't be that long. Uh, 20 years now when you get older is a very short time. Uh, when somebody says, well, that's a long time from now, that's 20 years. 20 years is not a long time. It comes by real quick. I've been in Mongolia now for 20 years. It just seems like yesterday that I rode up in this parking lot with Dad and came in his church. It just seems like yesterday, but it's been 20 years. Uh, since we've been gone, God has blessed us. I have my nephew named Tingus uh, that's working with us. My son, Ghana, quit his job up in, in uh, Washington, D.C. as a postman. Uh, moved back to Mongolia to work with us in the ministry. So I've got two young men serving with us while we're gone. That uh, We're right in the middle of a church plant in downtown Ulaanbaatar where we're, we were able to buy a building down there remodel the building right next to the university in Ulaanbaatar. And uh, they're going after the, the college students. Uh, we started an English school. That's a, a, a licensed English school where they we're giving uh, English lessons to college students. And we're able to bring them in there and witness to them, lead them to the Lord. And that's the way we plant churches in Mongolia is uh, through English lessons. You'll be surprised how many people want to learn English in foreign countries. Uh, one of the reasons I think English is the prevalent language in the world is because missionaries have always went and how they uh, meet people are through English lessons, giving English lessons. And, uh, and believe it or not, I used to teach English in Mongolia too. Uh, they don't know I have a southern accent. They think I'm British over there. They know I have an accent. They just don't know what it is. So they think they're learning British English when I talk to them. Uh, so I tell them to, uh, when I teach English, I go, do say what my, the way my wife says it. Don't say it the way I say it. So uh, we've we got a new church plant going. Uh, the country of Mongolia is locked down very strict with the COVID stuff going on. Ten people per meeting is all that's allowed in a church meeting or any, any kind of a gathering, only ten people at a time. Uh, my wife has been back twice to Mongolia since in the last year. Uh, to do some uh, legal paperwork and to see her family. Uh, when she goes back as a citizen, there's a 21-day quarantine in a hotel, uh, not in your house, but in a hotel, and they have a guard, so you can't leave the room. They bring the food to your door, knock on the door, you open the door and eat and put the tray back out in the hall when you're through eating. You have to stay there 21 days. We're going back in December after our last meeting, in the middle of December, and it's a 10-day quarantine uh, in our house now. They have uh, lightened that up a little bit, so we get to go home and quarantine in our house when we get back. So that won't be too bad. It takes me about 10 days to get over jet lag, so we'll go back uh, in December and do that. Uh, we have a new church plant going on. Uh, when we uh, go back, we had a church over in uh, Canton, North Carolina, that gave us enough money to buy a new apartment to start our sixth pro-life center. Uh, this would be number six that we've been able to start. Uh, we've already got the people in Mongolia that want to work with us. We have girls, from our young ladies from our church. They're girls when you're 66, but they're young ladies uh, that want to do the counseling that grew up in our churches. Uh, we have people that want to work the sonogram machine. We have, and see how, how God blesses we were trying to get a sonogram machine. He gave us two. So we have two sonogram machines to take back to use. And one of them is one of those 3D sonogram machines. Uh, so God really blessing this ministry. And I'll tell you why that he is. Because 
All of our ministries in Mongolia and Thailand are designed to get the gospel to people. That's the purpose of them. Uh, we're not in the uh, pro-life business. We're in that business because I have five to 20 women every day come in each one of those centers that we get to witness to, share the gospel with. We have women that are professing to be saved, uh, women that are saving their babies. Uh, men are coming in with their girlfriends and wives that are, we're witnessing to and leading to the Lord. And all of our ministries, our rescue mission, our, our hospital, our feeding centers that we're still operating, all of that stuff that we talk about is still in operation and we're still doing that in the country of Mongolia. Since we've been working there 20 years, we've baptized in this ministry 2,000 people in this ministry. Now, I didn't do it. This are people that work with us that we've led to the Lord and discipled. Everybody in our churches have been led to save through our ministry and discipled in our ministry. You don't have church transfers in Mongolia. There's no churches over there. Uh, there's only, to my knowledge, there's 200 known churches in the country of Mongolia that have Christian attached to them. And that can be anything. There's a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists there, uh, a lot of that stuff in the country. Uh, Baptist missionaries, I only know of four that I know of, uh, that I know and have met. There could be more that I don't know about, but it's a small country. There's only three million Mongolians in a country the size of Alaska. So uh, everybody there knows each other. That sounds like a lot of people, but that's not a lot of people. Uh, everybody tends to be related to each other there. Uh, if a Mongolian talks to another Mongolian for 30 or 40 minutes, they'll find out they're related some way. That's one of their favorite sayings. I found out that's my cousin after I talked to them. Uh, so everybody knows each other. We know all the missionaries there. If y'all have ever heard of Charles Keene, Dr. Charles Keene out of Milford, Ohio, uh, he's in the printing business. He, he has First Bible International, and he's the one that founded Bearing Precious Seed, if y'all have ever heard of that ministry. Uh, the other missionaries there are under him. Uh, they're related some way to his ministry. He's a good friend of ours. But all of those other missionaries go through his ministry. So... Harbor Evangelism is the only Baptist ministry there I know that's not affiliated. It's an actual independent ministry there in that country. Uh, and if we're still growing, thanks to folks like you that are working with us and praying for us. People are still being saved. Even God did allow us to plan a ministry that operates while we're not there. Uh, we work very hard. My dad, and I'm going to talk about him just a minute, uh, here for about the last 15 or 20 minutes because uh, y'all were associated with a really good missionary. I mean that. If y'all didn't know my dad or if you've never been to the mission field with him, has anybody over here ever been to the mission field with my dad? Tommy Tillman, anybody? He was an amazing guy. And I can say that uh, not only as his son but as his friend and somebody that worked with him. And I don't think it's wrong. Uh, this church belongs to Jesus Christ, but he puts people in our life uh, that influence us, and that's what they're here for. If you, and that's what we associate with people like my dad for and other people that love the Lord and do his service. If you look in your Bibles too, let's read 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I'll read them real quick, chapter 2 and 2 Timothy. These are very familiar verses uh, that we all read. Uh, Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 1 I'm just going to read a couple of verses Thou therefore my son be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also see Paul said what you heard about me teach that to other people what I'm here I'm an example for you to learn from me if you look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, just a couple of quick verses. And Paul said, we know what he was talking about to Corinthians, he was having a lot of trouble there, a lot of divisions, a lot of people teaching different things, and he said in verse 1 of chapter 11, 
He said, be you followers of me, even as I am also of Christ. So see, we can follow other people. My dad was a good one to follow. He would have been a good one to latch on to and follow and imitate him. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, he taught me everything I know. When I was saved, my dad taught me everything I know. I want to talk to you, though, a little bit about my dad at the side you don't know about dad, the side I know of him. Uh, I know him a lot different than you do. For the people in here that know him, he's never whipped you, has he? <laughs> so I know him a lot different than you do. I look at him different than you. I've been in churches with him before he died, and, uh, and they'd say, Oh, your dad's the greatest man I've ever met. And I go, oh, really? You don't know him as good as I do, I guarantee you. I have, and I think he's a good, I think he was the greatest man too, but he, he whipped me, so I have a whole different opinion of him than you. But I will tell him something about, about him that you don't know. I knew dad before he was a missionary. I was a kid growing up with him, and I'll tell you, there's, there's two things about my dad other than his, his, his handsomeness, his leprechaunish look, and his great personality, there was two things that made Dad a great missionary. And I'm going to go over just a couple of them with you real quick. And uh, I'm telling you these, these things, not bragging on him, but for your learning. Where that you can imitate him as well. Even though he's not here, I can tell you about him. And for your, if you want to be like Tommy Tillman, these are the two things that motivated Tommy Tillman and made him who he was. You know, number one was he was a born-again believer. He believed in Jesus Christ. He possessed the Holy Spirit. You have to have those two things. Those are two things you have to have. But he has some character traits that are not that are kind of unusual amongst people. One of them was that my dad was a hard-working guy, not just as a missionary, but his personal life. When I was growing up, my dad worked three jobs. Uh, he was a, a pastor at one time when I was in high school over in uh, Moody, Alabama, outside of Birmingham. He founded a church and planted the church that's still there today. It's called Park Avenue Baptist Church uh, in Moody, Alabama. He started that church in a little storefront in a crossroads out there when I was in high school. He started that church there. Plus, he worked three jobs and started that church. I never saw my dad when I was growing up. I would come in and, and say, who's that guy sleeping in there? That's dad. Because I never saw him. He was working. That's all he did. He did that in the ministry too. Uh, we're in a situation right now. We do this. The country of Mongolia does it too. Uh, look at Luke chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. I want to show us. Look at something here. I want to look at it. A little bit different portion of it. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 10. I'm sorry. Missionaries read this to you all the time, but I want to look at a different word in here I want to look at. It says, uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, it says, After these things the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two and two before his face in every city and place where he himself would go. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. The word I want to look at right there is laborers, workers. We need workers. Not just in Mongolia and Thailand. Christianity needs workers. Uh, we tend in Mongolia to have a lot of meetings. I've, I've, I've said this in my church before over there when I get up and preach. We like our Mongolians to preach, but about once a month I get to get up and preach. Uh, God did use us to plant that church, and I still like to get them wound up a little bit when I get up. When a foreigner gets up, they look at it a little bit different, so they enjoy me getting up because it's different than, than normal. But they love to meet. They love to have meetings and, and do Bible studies. And, 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 and But I stood at one time, looked out the back window of the church and there's like a thousand houses out that back window of that church. And I say, we need to go down to the end of this road at the end of those thousand houses and start witnessing the people and work back up to the church. And then when we get back to the church in about two or three years, we need to go right back to the start and do that again because by then there's going to be more new people moved in. So there's no end to getting out and working these meetings are good, but let me read this to you. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 
study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the truth. Bible studies are to work. They're trained us to get out and work where we rightly divide the truth, where when we do talk to people, we're telling them the, the truth. But a workman. Bible studies without putting legs on it is like a gallon of paint that's sitting in the can. Just sitting there. It's not doing anything. It's good paint. It's pretty. But till you take a brush out and put it on the wall, it's worthless. Bible studies without legs are not very good. They're good for us, but they're not good for what God wants us to do, and that's reach people with the gospel. Whether it be in Knoxville, Chattanooga, Mongolia, or Thailand, our job is to get up and work, and that's what my dad did. He was a hard-working man. In, in, in Mongolia, we planted a church one time in South Gobi. Uh, we had went down there and started a hospital. That was the second hospital uh, that we had started, which is, is not with us any longer because uh, we, we didn't live there and stay with us. There was a lot of stealing that was going on, so we had to close it. But we started a church in that village of 2,000 people, and it was me my, and my wife. She went with me. Dad and my wife, when he went, we all went together. And then our pastor, my wife's brother, Muran, that would go down there with his wife. We would drive eight hours one way to this village every Sunday for two years. We would, one of us would drive to that church that we'd started down there and preach. There was like three people or four people in the church. And we would drive eight hours one way, eight hours back every Sunday well, if, if I drove down there, Moore and our, I would stay in the church, and our home church there in the city and preach. And if he drove, I would stay back and preach in the home church. We drove down there for eight hours. They did that for two years, two solid years. And he even come to me a couple of times and said, Mitch, every time we go down there, those people just sit there and stare at me with their mouth hanging open. They, they, they don't act like they understand nothing I'm saying. They just look at me. Now, Nobody's doing anything, so we continue to do that. And you know what's there today? A church is there in that village with a pastor that was saved in that church. And because of that hard work, and that was work, a lot of work riding down there and doing that and driving back every Sunday. Because of that hard labor, God allowed a church to be planted. It's there today, and we, we visit them about once a year. We'll go down there and visit the church. They got about 30 people in the church with a pastor there that was saved in that church when we were down there preaching. But that required hard work. It required work. We had a missionary in Mongolia that come to me and my wife one time, and he said, I want to start a feeding center. We have, we have two feeding centers right now in the Gobi Dead and two separate villages. Uh, with two church plants with them that came out of those feeding centers. And he said, I want to start a, a church, I want to start a feeding center. I'm, I'm a new missionary, and what do I do to start? How do I start one? He pulled a notebook out, and I told him what to do. He had to go to the village, meet with the governor of the village, uh, had to find a building, had to buy uh, cooking supplies, have to go around to all the village, and, and when you find children that are poor, you get permission from their parents uh, legally to teach the Bible to them because in Mongolia it's illegal without parents' permission to teach Bible to children. And I said, then you have to hire somebody from the village to cook because if you don't do that, they won't let you come in there and do anything without helping the village. And I said, so you got to do that stuff. And he goes, well, that sounds like a lot of work. And I said, it is. He folded up his notebook, put it in his pocket, and in uh, six months, he had left Mongolia. He didn't want to work. See, it requires work. Getting out and reaching the lost people requires work. It don't require, they don't fall out of the sky. You have to go out and get them. And, and so that's what my dad did. One of the hardest working men you ever met. He was a pioneer. He would go to a country where there was no ministry and didn't know anybody, and he would start to work. He did that in Belize, Central America, uh, Thailand, and Mongolia. He founded all those works, and those still works are still running today. Every one of them are still operating without him because he started to work. He bore fruit that remained. 
And he did that with hard work. Another thing that my dad had, and I'll close with this, that we need and we don't have a lot of it is compassion. My dad was full of compassion. If you ever met him, I'm going to give you the definition of compassion. Compassion is sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. That's what compassion is. My dad was full of it. I know when the first time he saw those lepers in Thailand, uh, when they had no hands, no feet, you heard the story about how they come to church and bleed on the way to church or, or how he would eat with them when nobody else would eat with them and how people were saved because of his compassion for them. And I know it was the same compassion when he went to Mongolia and saw people that had never heard the name of Jesus Poor children didn't have food or homes there, starting feeding centers and hospitals. My dad was full of compassion. Uh, some of y'all, uh, you know, compassion, somebody with compassion witnessed to you. You ever thought about that? When you heard the gospel, that somebody with compassion gave that gospel to you? Somebody with compassion started this church. Somebody with compassion felt like somebody that this area needed to hear about Christ started a church right here in this area. Some of y'all, because of your wife having compassion, are married today. Right? I know my wife, that's why I'm married. She had compassion on me. We need compassion. The world's full of, of people right now with no compassion. And we're being groomed by TV and Internet that does that to us. And we sit around watching that stuff and we start where we don't have any concern for people. We don't have concern that people are dying going to hell and they're dying and going to hell today. And they're doing it right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. They're doing it in Chicago, right, Brother Mike? And they're doing it in Chattanooga, Tennessee. They're dying and going to hell in Mongolia and Thailand, Mexico. There's no shortage of people dying and going to hell. And if you watch TV all day, I run into people in, in churches that say, I don't care about those people over in, in foreign countries. They hate us anyway over there. No, they don't. That's what they say on TV. Do you think that TV is going to do anything but uh, make us feel bad? There's nothing. That's all owned by the devil. When you sit and watch that stuff, all it does is make us feel uh, defeated. That's what the devil wants us to do. People in the, in the world love the United States. Why do you think they're trying to come here? Everybody wants to come here. This is still, even with all our problems, this country is still the greatest country on earth right now. The rest of the world is in bad shape too. It's a great country. And, and the devil wants us to feel defeated. He don't want us to tell people about Christ. I even hear people say, People in America has all heard the gospel. I, went, I was in Oklahoma City several years ago with a pastor out there. He's passed away now. A good guy. Man, love that guy to death. He died. But we would knock on doors in Oklahoma City and met people that had never heard the gospel. There's people out here in Knoxville. As many churches there are in this city, there's people that's never heard the gospel. You can go in downtown Knoxville, and I guarantee you there's people down there that's heard the name of Jesus in a cuss word. That's the only way they know his name, is through a cuss word. They've never heard the gospel. They've never heard uh, of Christ other than cussing. Uh, so we need to get busy, and, I, and I'm here to inspire you. You might be sitting here today, and you might say, you know what, uh, I don't have any compassion on people. I've been watching too much TV. And I have no compassion at all on people. And you know what? God will give it to you if you ask for it. All you got to do is ask for it. If you've been saved, he'll give it to you. But you got to ask for it. You got to want to ask for it. Let's read. I'm going to close. I'm going to turn it back over to Brother Lawson. Let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. I got to close with the word of God because I'm not saying this God is. Ephesians chapter 2. I know when my sister died, when you're a, a born-again believer in Christ and you possess the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, I know when my sister died, my oldest one, uh, it hit me pretty hard. Uh, I was in Mongolia, uh, way over on the other side of the world, and a, 
And my mother called me. And I, when my mother called me, I knew something was wrong when she called me. And she said, Mitch Teresa died. And I said, man, this hit me like a, like a ton of bricks. That was my old, oldest sister. I had a really good relationship with her, loved her. And I, walked, I told my wife, I said, just give me a minute. And I walked back in my bedroom, closed the door, and prayed. And God took that from me immediately. Amen. Where I walked back in the living room, and I said, I, I feel pretty good. I'm ready to go now. You know, we got business handled and come back to America. But you know, if you're in this room today and you're saved, you could be here with no compassion for other people. You could be in today and don't care about anything about people going to hell. Uh, you could be that way. That don't mean you're not saved. It just means that you that that's the way you're you're acting right now. But God can change that. Let's read. Let's go to Ephesians chapter two, verse one through ten. Ephesians two. Well, I'm on the wrong one right now. Ephesians 3, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what happens when you get old. Y'all know that? Ephesians 3. Let's go to verse 16. I know I'm there now. Let's go to verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. That means you get down on your knees and pray to the Lord. Bow your knee to the King of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. If you're saved today and you're born again, you have the spirit of Jesus Christ living inside you. That spirit that makes you know right from wrong, good from evil, that tells you what you're supposed to do. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the, the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Listen to this verse. Now he, unto him that is able to exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. That's some amazing verses, isn't it? That Christ, God, the creator of the universe, the creator of all things, lives inside of us. We have the power to have compassion, to work. We can do the same things that God used Tommy Tillman to do. The only thing holding us back is us. It's the only thing stopping us. God wants us to do that stuff. He created us into good works. He created us to go out and tell people about Him. That's why He saved us. Uh, he saved us to go to meetings, but to put legs on those meetings. So if you today don't have compassion, or you don't feel motivated or led to tell people about Christ, we're living in the last days, folks. I think the Lord's going to come back any time. And if he don't, when you get my age, you're going to, we're going to meet him at any time. Some of us older people might be sooner or later than later. And uh, if you're here today, I beg you to start serving the Lord because he's coming soon, folks. Thank you, brother.